This is our Bible study for this week. It is something that the Lord led me to that I did a long time ago. And I don't know who this is for. Maybe it's for me. But this I know. I know that this is what the Lord wanted, without a doubt. And so our Bible study for this evening, the title of it is What Does Salvation Mean to You? Now, I know that we're all going to say, well, salvation means that we were saved. We were going in one direction, and we turned around and started going in a completely different direction. That is the definition of repenting or repentance. We have to repent. But you see, we all have repented from things that are unlike for someone else. Some of us had went down a road a long way. Some of us hadn't been down a road that far. But it doesn't matter how far you went down that road or how little you went down that road. The great and marvelous thing is that you turned around and started in the other direction. So what does salvation mean to you? It's going to mean different things. Some people might say it literally saved my life. Some people might say it saved me from a life of addiction. Some people might say it saved me from bad choices. Some people, salvation gave them hope when they had none. So really, salvation, yes, it's talking about us being saved, not by any work of our own, but by Jesus Christ. We just have to grab hold of his great gift, salvation, and we have to accept it for our own. His death on the cross, it became ours. But unless it changes you, you see, that's the catch. That's the key. It has to change you. And so here tonight, we're going to look at three portions of Scripture. We're going to look at Bartimaeus. We're going to look at Stephen. And we're going to look at the father in the story of the prodigal son. And we're going to see what salvation means to these. Lord, we ask that you would bless the reading of your word, that you would bless this short time that we have together. And Father, we give you the praise, for it's in Christ Jesus' name we come. Amen. I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 10. The book of Mark, chapter 10. What does salvation mean to you? Well, this is the story of the blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus was someone that was sitting on a road in which Jesus was coming down. Couldn't see, but he could hear. And he had heard the stories. And he knew that his life was not very good, but he knew that Jesus, he did miracles. And so here comes Jesus down the road. Look with me, chapter 10, verse 46. 
Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come to me. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. He had one purpose in life and that was to beg for enough money to eat for that day. But now he's no longer stuck in one place. He's jumping up and down, seeing everything there is to see and following Jesus wherever he goes. This teaches us that what Jesus meant to Bartimaeus was he was a savior that had time for him. Think of it. Jesus took the time to minister to a blind beggar sitting by the road. You know, a lot of times we think of God as someone who is just there in case we have an emergency. Jesus is there and he's waiting to hear us speak. He's waiting to hear us ask. But Jesus is much more than that. He is a God that pursues us. You ever heard the phrase provenient grace? That is grace that goes before a person until they come to the realization that the Holy Spirit is drawing them to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's the grace that goes before. How did that grace come to Bartimaeus? He could hear. He could hear the crowd. Here comes Jesus. This is my opportunity to have a new life. This is my opportunity to have a new purpose. This is my opportunity to find hope for another day. Jesus could have kept right on going. None of the crowd thought that he should stop. But then Jesus heard that voice and said, bring that man to me. Isn't it amazing? that the creator of the universe wants to have a relationship with you and he will pursue you to the ends of the earth to bring you home to where you belong. When Bartimaeus, I'm sure, talked about Jesus, I'm sure, I can't believe he had time for an old blind man. Second story, Acts chapter seven. We find this man named Stephen. We know that Stephen was a wonderful man of God. We know that he was on the first board of administration we read where it says that he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, folks, that is a great testimony. 
If somebody says about you, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, that means that Jesus can be seen in them. But you see, Stephen's life didn't last all that long after he was put on what we would call the first board of administration. We read where it says that people begin to find a way to get him because of his beliefs. And so when Stephen thinks of Jesus, I believe that Stephen probably thought of Jesus as the Savior who would cheer him on. I'm not going to read Acts chapter 7. You know the story. Through false accusation, he is brought before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. They ask him, does he have anything to say for himself? And he begins to preach a sermon that begins at Abraham and brings it all the way up until the present day. And when he finished, he basically calls them all a bunch of snakes. And when he does that, they kill him. Jewish people didn't have the right to pronounce death. But there was a man that was watching. His name was Saul. You know that name? It wasn't his name forever. We know the guy more as Paul. And I guess you have to call him for who he is. He was the Apostle Paul. But you see, Saul was there giving his approval to what was going on. And it says they drug him out and then they began to stone him. I would like to call your attention to verse 40, 51 to the end of the chapter. You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into the heavens and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus, catch this, standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. We think of God as one who sits in heaven looking down on us. Theological word for that is transcendent. But God is also present here. And the theological word for that is imminent. Sometimes we think, oh, God's sitting up in heaven. He is looking down on us like we might be looking down at a sporting event. But that's not Jesus. Jesus got right down here on earth. He got his feet and hands dirty, even to the point that he died on an old rugged cross. 
But after he ascended back to the Father, we read in several places, Ephesians 1, verse 20, Colossians 3, verse 1, Hebrews 1, verse 3. And all these places say that Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father. But that's not what we find here in the verses that we just read. He was standing. He was standing. At the most difficult time of Stephen's life, he looked up and there he saw the Son of God standing, cheering him on, letting him know that it's worth it. Hang in there. I'm right here. It's amazing. Jesus is standing in encouragement, standing, giving him all he needed to make it home. And you know, in some translations, it doesn't say he died. It said that he fell asleep. I like that. He fell asleep here and woke up home. And I wonder who he saw first. I wonder who he saw first. You see, is to Stephen, Jesus was the Savior who was cheering him on. And then thirdly, it's the story of the father in the story of the prodigal son. You'll find this story in the book of Luke chapter 15. But you see, there is three little stories or two little stories. And then what we find is we find the story of the prodigal son or the story of the lost son. These are stories that Jesus is telling so that people will understand how much each individual means to him. He starts off by telling the story of the lost sheep. He said, say there's a hundred sheep, 99 are safe, but one is lost. And in that story, Jesus says he leaves the 99 to go find the one. The parable of the lost coin. Probably it was a dowry. It was kind of like a crown. And, and there were these precious coins that was in it. And, and probably this is what is meant. And, and she has this headpiece and, and it's worth lots of money. And she has every coin but one, but she's not satisfied that she has every coin but one. She wants every one. And it says she tears the house apart until she finds the lost coin. And then we come to the story of what we know to be the prodigal son. And we realize that what it was, was the younger son goes to the dad and he basically says, you know, I've grown up here, but I want to know what it's like in the big city. And he said, Dad, I would like my share of the inheritance. Dad gives it to him. If it was only two of them, the oldest son would have got two thirds of what the father owned. And the youngest son would have gotten one third. So we're talking about a significant amount of wealth. Dad gave it to him and away he went. And he said he spent all of his money on high living. While he had a lot of money, he had a lot of friends. But as the money began to run out, guess what? 
so did the friends. And all of a sudden, he finds himself wanting, doesn't even know where his next meal is coming from. So he finds a job that most Jewish boys wouldn't be caught dead doing, feeding the pigs. But it gets even worse than that. It said that he began to eat the food that he was giving to the pigs for their meals. And then he remembers what it was like to be home. And then he decides, I'll go home and I'll go to my father and I will tell him that I'm sorry. I'm not worthy to be his son, but if he will just let me live there as a hired hand, that's all I deserve. And all of a sudden, the young son begins to make his way home. And as he is making his way home, we see the father standing out by the road, looking down the same road that the son disappeared a long time before. Fathers waiting. You see, Jesus to the young son was the Savior who was always there. But you see, the young son is not the star of this parable. The main character of this parable is the father. Because you see, as the son comes in sight, dad begins to run to meet the son. He grabs him, my son that was lost is now home. You know, a lot of times we think of God as one who can't wait to judge us. But that's not what we find in the book of Luke chapter 15 in the story of the prodigal son. We find a father that is waiting for his lost son to call out to him to make his way back home. And he's standing there with arms wide open. Jesus to the prodigal son or the dad. He was somebody that was always there. He, he, he was still waiting he, because he loved him. You see, it doesn't matter where you've been and it doesn't matter what you've done. And it doesn't matter how long you have run. But I promise you this. When you realize that Jesus is what you need, all you have to do is turn toward home and Jesus will come running. I know that we all have stories to tell about our point of salvation and I know that Jesus means different things to different people but I challenge you at this time to think about what does Jesus really mean to you I hope that each of you have a wonderful day If you've got a story to tell, I sure would like to hear it. Have a good evening. Love you all.